Hello, this is Julia Gamelina of Madam Architect, and you're listening to U.S. Modernist Radio. Mama don't allow no architecture around here. Mama don't allow no architecture around here. Oh, I don't care what mama don't allow, gonna draw mine modern anyhow. Mama don't allow no architecture around here. Welcome to U.S. Modernist Radio, where we talk and laugh with people who enjoy, own, create, dream about, preserve, love, and hate modernist architecture, the most exciting and controversial buildings in the world. I'm Tom Guild. As New Yorkers grew more prosperous in the 1960s, they wanted to escape to the Hamptons of Long Island, a place at the time of mostly farmland and where summer is a verb. It's also where, after working briefly for Philip Johnson, architect Norman Jaffe set up his own practice. Within a few years, everybody who was anybody in New York society wanted a Jaffe house. Known for meticulous design and detail and unrelenting creativity, Jaffe soon became top gun in Hampton's modernism. But by 1993, Jaffe was stricken with prostate cancer, an unhappy marriage, and profound disillusionment from affluent and demanding clients who often refused to pay what they owed. It did not end well. Joining us today in our continuing series, Children of Genius, is his son, architect and artist Miles Jaffe. And now, your host, George Smart. Hey, thanks, Tom. Some of the most fascinating interviews we've had over the years have been with the children of modernist architects. In our Children of Genius series, we've been honored to speak with Raymond and Dion Neutra, sons of Richard, Guillaume Schindler, great-grandson of Rudolf, Randy Koenig, son of Pierre, Judith Lautner, daughter of John, and Susan and Eric Saarinen, children of Arrow. And then there's Eric Lloyd Wright and David Wright, grandsons of you-know-who, Frank, Emily Ain, daughter of Gregory, Celia Bertoya, daughter of Harry, Eames Demetrios and Carla Hartman, grandchildren of Charles and Ray Eames, Erica Fometer, granddaughter of Walter Gropius, Annie Gwathmy, daughter of Charles, Gary Wexler, son of Donald, and Eric Williams, son of E. Stewart. It sounds like a biblical reference. Or, or like <laughs> Game of Thrones or something. <laughs> it's an incredible privilege to learn what life was really like for the families of the men and women who designed the architecture we love. Behind the awards and the immaculate houses, the mostly caring projects, and the unfortunate renovations and demolitions, we learn that growing up with an architect can be, what's that euphemism? Challenging. <laughs> U.S. Modernist Radio is underwritten by Diane Bald and the Budman family, restoring significant architecture in Toronto, Los Angeles, Malibu, and Palm Springs. Miles, when I first discovered the website that you built about your dad, it was, it was full of data. It had photos and pictures and descriptions and, and citations and hyperlinks and all the stuff that you would expect to find on a website about an architect. And lately, when I went back to the site, what I found was a, a very moving essay that you had written about your dad. So when was this shift? I don't remember exactly when I did it in the past couple of years. To me, my father is not about architecture. It's a totally different experience. It's about him as a human being and his effect in my life. And I see his works being torn down routinely. And it seemed to me that that was over to some extent. You know, And obviously, you, you're keeping it alive in a way. And there are other people who are trying in, in, a, in a small way. But that's not what it is for me anymore. It's about him as a man, as a human being. Well, tell us about him as a human being and as a dad and as an architect that, I guess, inspired you to go into the field, right? Well, that's a long story, but uh, I'll start at the beginning. Yeah, I mean, please. my father uh, was born in 1932 in the height of the Great Depression, or the depth of the Great Depression. His father was a jack of all trades. He was a lumberjack. He drove the milk delivery cart. I mean, he was a junk man. He did whatever he had to do to keep his family together. And as far as I'm concerned, he was a fabulous success because if you look at what happened to families during the Great Depression, a lot of them just blew up and people were fragmented and lost forever. And 
yet he managed to keep his family together and they survived. My father's mother was a very difficult woman and never considered her husband to be a success. He was always a failure. So there was a great deal of pressure on my father and his older brother, Alan, who uh, became an actor later in life, to succeed. And this intense Jewish upbringing and the guilt trips that got played on them. So my father's brother, Alan, left home at the age of 15 or 16 to join the Merchant Marines just to get out of the house. And he was gone. And that left my father as sort of the sole focus of his mother's intent to drive him to success or whatever it was. And I have some very telling pictures of myself with my grandparents from when I was young. One is I have my back to my camera, my hands behind my back, and my head is down. And my grandmother is sitting on a couch facing me, and she's wagging a finger at me like I'm in trouble. The other one is it's my grandparents and me. And I'm standing with my grandfather. We both have our arms around each other. I'm maybe four. And my grandmother is standing three feet away, clenching her pocketbook in front of her. So you can get a read from sort of what the dynamics were of the family at that point. That's a very different kind of Norman Rockwell moment. (laughs) Right, I guess. I mean, so this is what kind of Norman grew up with, which was this sort of, you know, the Jewish guilt, you're not good enough success. So he was always, I think, driven to succeed beyond a measure of what he personally wanted, but in in this sort of psychological way to to be a success, because that's what he was programmed to do by his mother. Yeah. And he carried this guilt throughout his life. And it was a burden for him, especially after my parents split. I was around four and my parents split up and we were living in Berkeley and Norman went to New York to be an architect. I think he worked for Philip Johnson for a bit, but that left me with my mother and single woman in 1962, we moved in to her parents' place outside of Chicago. A few years later, she was killed in a car accident. Wow. So my father shows up outside of school with a dog on a leash and says, do you, do you want to go to New York? And I'm like, sure. Drop the dog off at the pound, get on the plane, go to New York. Because obviously there was a custody battle brewing with my grandparents. Okay. And he just nipped it in the bud and took responsibility. So I get to New York and I move into the office that he shares with another architect named Bruce Graham in 962 Park Avenue. And our bedroom is literally sort of a side room in this office with this little roach infested closet kitchen next to it. And every morning there were a dozen people that would come into this place and go to work. And that's where I lived when we first came to New York. That's where we lived. We slept in the same fold out couch. So you lived in the office with your dad full on for how long? Well, that was a bumpy road. So, <laughs> you know, he, one of the first things he tried to do was, was sort of get us out of there. And within a year, probably, we had moved into a little walk-up apartment around the corner. But still, I mean, he was in the office all the time working. Yeah. I would come home from school to the office. And I was running blueprints. I was eight years old. I was running blueprints. I was playing on the drafting board. Were you on one of those old ammonia machines that did the blueprints? Yes. I did those too growing up in my dad's office. I always thought I was going to die back there because the thing would leak and ammonia would shoot up in your face. It was terribly smelly. (laughs) So I have a file full of letters from my third grade class thanking my father for the office visit our class went on because our entire class went like three blocks away from PS6 to the office. And he gave a presentation of a house that he was working on. And of course, this is New York City. And you know, he asked if there's any questions and one little kid raises his hand and he goes, yes, where's the swimming pool? <laughs> <laughs> so as an aside, that was, what was his name? Roslyn was the kid's name, Danny Roslyn. Okay. And Years, years, and years later, Rosalind's father commissions my father to do a beach house in Southampton. That must be Mel. That's Mel Rosalind. Okay. And Mel Rosalind was a, an underwear manufacturer. And his, his whole thing was the 60s were really good for me because <laughs> all the girls were burning their bras. So they had to buy new ones, right? <laughs> okay. So this was Mel Rosalind's son in your class. Right. So Danny Roslin one day, as I go down, you know, the tangent here, uh, Danny Roslin one day throws an egg 
through the window into the office. Who knows why? The next day, my father's waiting in the vestibule out, you know, outside of the office, but before the street, it's kind of a double door vestibule. And he's waiting for Danny to come by and he's going to give him a hard time. So he sees Danny coming by and he rushes out and he trips and falls and pins Danny to the pavement. Danny's you know, <laughs> eight years old at this point. <laughs> Scared the crap out of him. <laughs> so we go from the apartment Norman goes out on his own. He gets another office around the corner from Matt. So now he's at 125 East 80th Street. Okay. And we, he can't afford the apartment and the office. We give up the apartment, and I'm living in the office again. And in this office, my bedroom is literally a closet <laughs> with no windows and, you know, drafting supplies stored in there. Okay. And his bedroom is the front room, which is a conference room with a couch. And the couch folds out, and that's his bed at night. Okay. okay. It was a rough time. And it was okay. I didn't know. I mean, I didn't know any different. I was 10 years old or whatever. But, I, you know, we'd, we'd come home and the eviction notice would be under the door because the rent was late. And I remember going down to the AT&T building to pay the bill in cash so they wouldn't turn off the phones. Ah, uh, yeah. So, I mean, and he was struggling. I mean, it was tough. It was, it was tough. This was about 1970, 72, somewhere in there? Earlier, late 60s. Okay. I think. So actually, yeah, mid-60s, late 60s, he's got a commission in the Hamptons, and he's doing a project out here. So we start coming out here and spending more time here. Okay. And then later, he was doing this project, Village Greens on Staten Island. It was a 400-unit townhouse, kind of California-style townhouse kind of concept. And for one reason or another, he got canned. But by stipulation of his contract, he got a payout of like 40 grand, which mm -hmm. was more money than he'd ever seen ever anywhere in his life. Yeah. This is 1968, you know, maybe. So he bought a piece of land in Bridgehampton and then proceeded to build a house. In fact, he, I think he borrowed, got a loan from a client or something. To, I don't remember what the deal was, but he got some deal from a client. He got into this property and built a house. Before that, he had had some success in New York. And, and he actually we got an apartment down at Kipps Bay, down at 33rd, 33rd yeah, Street. Nice. Which was pretty nice. And it was a nice. And there was a Nico Sagrafos, who was a, a furniture designer was good friends with Norman and they had collaborated on some projects. He was in the same building. That was the beginning of the transition to sort of the East end of Long Island. Okay. And he gave up that apartment and finally gave up the office in New York and the house became the office. So yeah, there I was, I was living back in the office again. It was kind of this up and down thing, but it was a pretty nice office at that point. It was a house that, you know, he had designed and we were here. And which house was this? This was Pheasant Walk. Okay. So was this the one for the Berlins eventually? Well, this was, this was next to the houses he did for Sasha Berlin. Okay. So he did the Wedge, which was the West House. He did that sort of a barn-like thing, which was the East House in the first one. And then the third lot, Norman made a deal with Sasha, and that's where he built this house. Okay. And so now you're out in the Hamptons. And when did your dad really start to hit it with these commissioned houses out there? Well, I mean, I think... Because I know he did the Becker House in 69. Right. Well, before that... I, I guess the first oceanfront house was the Shulman House. Okay. Which is a very righty in, you know, horizontal sliding masses right on the dunes. And it was nice. I mean, it was a nice house. It was small. I mean, and that was the lifestyle of the time. And to put it in perspective, at that time, the late 60s, the people who were coming to the East End were getting away from the business pressures of New York. There was no television. I mean, maybe Channel 8, Fuzzy with Rabbit Ears. There was no entertainment. They basically rolled up the sidewalks and put them away at night. There was no cell phones. There was nothing here. And it was, it was the country. And it was a break from all that pressure of the city and business. Sure. So the houses were a joy. They were absolutely a joy. And people really appreciated them. So the first one, I think, was the Shulman residence on the ocean on Surfside Drive. Berlin's were the first out here. Then there was the Shulman house. The first big commission for Norman was the Pearlbinder house. Okay. In Sagaponic. That was the first big budget house. Now, at the time, I think the budget was $100,000. The Berlin's houses were built for, I think, twenty. <laughs> so this was a big deal. And Norman really put his heart into it and did a magnificent piece of work. There's, there's no question about it. Yeah, it's a wonderful house. One of the finest things he's ever done. All the levels that sort of half levels nested together. And I mean, it sounds odd, but you go up a couple steps from the living room to the dining room kitchen. And then you go up around behind the kitchen 
to the kitchen counter level. So the floor at that level becomes the kitchen counter. I mean, there was just these beautiful nesting together of all of these elements. Really nice way. Great house. Becker was around the same time, I think a little after. The Becker house is interesting because we had just come back from a trip to England, the British Isles. And my father took us because he thought he was going to die. He thought he was going to have a heart attack. And he wanted to see Europe before he died. Yeah. Uh, he just had stress, but he didn't know. And he came and back he was just was about the- 48 or so at that point. Not that old. Uh, right. But, I mean, it was intense. I mean, the business is intense and the yeah. people are intense. Anyway, that the Becker House was the result of seeing some of these abandoned stone castles in Ireland, things like that. Yeah, it's a beautiful structure. I really enjoy looking at it. The Pearlbinder House, I think, is really what put him on the map. I mean, that was the big one. While we're talking, folks, you can be looking at all these houses at usmarnest.org slash Jaffe, J-A-F-F-E. Now, Miles, Sandy Pearlbinder made a film about modernist architects, kind of a satirical film. Was that about your dad or somebody else? I haven't seen it. <laughs> you haven't? Okay. Well, I will send you yeah. the link. Okay. Uh, she made it in 1989, uh-huh. and we just put it on the website. Oh, that's interesting. Now, her house, her and Stephen's house, there was a fire there, which burned the whole place down. They had to rebuild and then they had to rebuild after storms and things like that. But they still have the house now, I believe now, 52 years later. Well, the house didn't burn down. The house There was a fire in the house and there was some damage. Okay. And it was fixed. Later, there was you know, a big hurricane. And actually, there were seven houses along that stretch. It's Potato Road, right on the ocean. And six of them were moved back at the same time by house movers okay. in preparation for this hurricane that was coming. It was a big deal. And there, there were six houses being moved at the same time. Every moving company you know, on Long Island was out there with heavy equipment, lifting these houses up, putting them back. Driving how how did they have time to organize moving houses like that? I mean, hurricane, you get what, four days notice or something? You know, when you have enough money, <laughs> anything is possible. Okay. Makes sense. And there was certainly no shortage of money down there. Okay. Now, your dad had these great commissions, but as you said, it was really stressful dealing with the clients and their expectations. I know when I have read about John Laudner out in California, he was saying that all his clients were either, I believe the phrase was they were either poor geniuses or rich bastards. Well, you know, the smaller houses were getaways, and people really loved them, and they appreciated the experience. And these people were, in a sense, avant-garde. Okay. They were not doing a traditional ranch house or a traditional sort of style house. They were risking something with, you know, a a modernist architect who was trying some new things. And they were avant-garde. So, for example, Sasha Berland, who was a music producer, was right there at the cutting edge of what was happening in music. And, you know, that translates. One fine art translates to another. Sure. Harold Becker was a film director, and he made commercials, but he also made these films. So they, these people were really sort of tuned in, and they, they were avant-garde, and they were hiring the avant-garde architect because that was what fit with them. Okay. So the pearl binders were not avant-garde. They just had a pile of money, and they hired the avant-garde architect to assume that status for okay. themselves. And that really became sort of the model for, for the future is like the people with money would hire the avant-garde guy, just like they would buy, um, you know, the Rolls Royce or whatever the, the symbol of wealth was at the moment. And the avant-garde architect is, of course, the symbol of, oh, I have a Norman Jeffy house, you know. And it was pretty much all downhill from there because, you know, as, as the amount of money grows, the quality of these people tends to diminish okay. precipitously. Norman used to refer to these houses, it was the Eddie Cohen house, which at the time, 1981, 82, was a $2.5 million house, which at the time was top of the market. Oh, yeah, that's and huge was, in the 80s. It was, I think it was 6,500 square feet. I mean, it was a giant. It's been described as an inverted aircraft carrier that washed ashore. Okay. <laughs> anyway, Norman referred to these houses as pig outs because, you know, here was all of this energy and all of this effort and labor and materials that went into some guy's house that he was going to show off to his friend on weekends. 
And he was like, well, why isn't this in a public building? Why isn't this energy being put into something that more people can appreciate? So my father tried really hard to get into other kinds of work. And probably most successful effort was uh, the Jewish Center of the Hamptons, the synagogue. Right. That's why I was going to ask you about, because that is the one that's cited so often as being his most beautiful work. Norman, he's sick to death of these clients and their vacation houses and the money and the whole thing. And in terms of the money, Norman never kept track of the cost of a project. So he would go to contract with people and it was a standard AIA contract and it was 15% of cost of construction. And they'd say, okay, our budget's 300,000. And he'd say, fine. He'd start billing them at 15% of 300,000. So during the course of the construction, the people would add and they would change and they would, project would grow and Norman would try different things and the project would end up costing $600,000. So the project's basically now complete, and Norman's trying to settle up his billing, and he's been paid, I'm not great with math, he's been paid, you know, $40,000 of his $50,000 fee, and uh, he realizes the project has doubled in scope and scale. So the fees really double what it was. So he sends the client a bill for basically double the fee, and the client's like, wait a minute, and then we end up in arbitration, and it's always a nightmare. But basically, he never bothered to keep up with the business side in that respect. So he was always under the gun. You're describing the case with the Aldas in Watermill. Well, and not just the Aldas. This was common practice. The Aldas were really, truly awful. Arlene Alda ran that project. Constant demands for changes, this, that, and the other thing. For every change or request that Arlene Alda had, my father sent off a letter. Dear Mrs. Alda. As per your request for such and such a change, please be advised that this will cost more. This will take longer. You may wish to consider it an alternative. And there were hundreds of these letters. So at the end of the project, Norman sends them a bill. They refuse to pay. He takes them to arbitration. Your arbitration is like court without rules. Okay. And the judge is some guy. And the guy was enamored with Arlene Alda, which having met her, I cannot understand why anybody would be enamored with her. But- it became clear after a year or two in arbitration that a year in arbitration, oh, that's a more. long time I mean, you know, and legal fees. I mean, they just drag on and on and on. It's like court without rules. It's just, it's, just a, there's, it's insane. So after a year or two in this thing, I think it was two years. Well, actually we discussed this. I said, well, if you're not, he said, you're not, I'm not going to win. The arbitrator's in love with Arlene Alda. I said, well, why are you doing this then? Why don't you just walk away? So he went back to arbitration and he made the Aldas an offer. And he said, look, he said, you owe the money. Give it to the charity of your choice. Don't pay me. Just give it to the charity of your choice. We'll call it a day. The Alda said, no. So that gives you an idea what kind of people they are. But this was a common problem for Norman, okay. getting paid. Okay. Um, and it was, it, was, it was largely his fault for not being on top of the business, on top of the money, which he was never really concerned about. I mean, he was concerned about making a beautiful piece of work and his idea was that you make the project happen no matter what. Your job is to get the project done. But it sounds like he was on top of some things. I mean, if he wrote all those letters to clients saying these are the consequences of your change orders, that takes a lot of work. Well, at that point, he had a pretty good staff and he had been through this enough and been in arbitration enough that he knew that you had to paper the file. Okay. If you were going to have a leg to stand on. Yeah. So, I mean, he did learn from this experience, but I mean, it didn't keep it from happening. So when we get to the Jewish Center, Norman is sick to death of dealing with this residential architecture and these neurotic people who can never be satisfied, who don't pay their bills. He just can't stand it anymore. And it's a far cry from the likes of Harold Becker or Chico Hamilton, you know, some of the truly avant-garde people that he worked with. And we're, we're fast friends with because they could relate to each other. Right. So he hears that the Jewish Center is going to do a synagogue. And he basically appeals to the board of the Jewish Center and as, as an architect. He's like, you know, he offers to, to be their architect. And they look at him and they're like, ah, you do houses for rich people. And of course, they're all rich people, right? Yeah. On the board. But he's like, you do houses for rich people. What do you know about a synagogue, right? They, they don't want any part of it. So he goes to Evan Frankel, who's the head of the, the whole thing over there. And Evan's not buying. So he goes to each board member individually and appeals to them and 
tries to, you know, suss out where they are and where they stand and how to deal with this thing. I mean, very intelligent approach to this whole thing. And they're still not buying. So finally, he says, look, he says, I'll do it for no fee. And the board members look at each other and they go, no fee? What do we got to lose? <laughs> and that's how we got the job. It sounds like you're doing a Mel Brooks impression. <laughs> well, it wasn't supposed to be Mel Brooks, but that works because Mel Brooks Jewish, the whole thing. So I'm good with that. Okay. So that's how we got the commission. You know, basically, the, I think the deal he made was they paid his staff for their time, but no, Norman didn't take a fee for the project. Okay. And we really, really threw ourselves into that in a big way. I mean, that was. So you were working on that with him at the time? I was working on that with him. In fact, you know, I, we, we were having dinner one night at the old stove pub in Bridgehampton, which was this fabulous steakhouse. It's been taken over by somebody else now. It's terrible. But back in the day, we're sitting there one, one winter night and we're talking about ideas. And Norm is telling me that he has this idea for the Jewish Center for the Synagogue of these giant columns that are like a forest of trees. And then he's like, Maybe we should have a dirt floor and they should have to take their shoes off before they come in so they're barefoot in the dirt. <laughs> <laughs> now, what year was this? What, what was the year of the synagogue? Uh, you know, I, I can't place it. I'm going to say 88. Hang on a second. Let me look at something. I'm seeing 87 when it started. Yeah, that's right then. So it was, it was done in 88. It was a good project. And I, you know, I'm my father's fiercest critic. I mean, I would really, we'd get into crits in the office and I'd really, really take a hard line with him uh, over a lot of stuff. And, you know, I, I went to school to study industrial design because by that time I knew more architecture than the architecture program at RISD. And I thought, okay, this is a waste of my time. Yeah. Uh, and industrial design is analytical, you know, constant analysis and evaluation. And I was very critical of my father's stuff. And I'm looking at the Jewish Center and I found like three little niggling things to, to bash him on. And they weren't even bashed. They were just criticisms. I mean, there were just three little things. Uh, really, it, it's a fine piece of work. And to be in that building when there's a, a service going on or a ceremony going on is a really powerful experience. I mean, it, it's really it's really something. Yeah, Paul Goldberger says it's your dad's greatest accomplishment in his career. Goldberger liked 565 Fifth Avenue a lot, and so do I. I mean, that's that was another home run, I think, that building. Really a major building, but really a nice piece of work. Yeah, I'm looking at a photo of 565 Fifth Avenue now. It's really, really gorgeous. And who was that designed for? Who was the client? Uh, Axel Stowski. Was that a business or a person? Axel Stowski is a guy who owns half a dozen high-rises in New York. Okay. So this was a project to then he would lease out to other people. Yeah, he's a commercial developer. So this was an office building, basically. Right, it's an office building. I'll have to go buy it next time I'm in New York, which should be soon. Yeah, 46th Street and 5th Avenue. So now we're in the late 80s. Your dad is remarried by this time. He has two kids. Two little boys. And he's not particularly happy. And you write a little bit about this on the website. So can you share more about what that time was like for your dad? We were uh, a bit distant at that point. He had this new family, which was a total shock to me. And so I come to New York in 1965 after losing my mother and my grandparents, which I didn't even realize until some 20 years later, and Norman has this fabulous girlfriend, Dolores Ray, who I will never forget. And imagine sort of the most stunning, mod, 60s model woman who is intelligent and sweet and kind. I mean, it's like, I'm like, wow, I can, I can deal with this. This is okay. You yeah. Know? I mean, I just lost my mother, but here's this lovely person. And... A year later, she dumps Norman because he's committed to his work and not to her. And I lose Dolores. <laughs> okay. Yeah. At which point I decide that Norman's girlfriends are Norman's girlfriends and they have nothing to do with me. I'm on my own here. And then the succession of women that ran through his life, some of whom tried to mother me in one way or another or not, I wasn't having any part of it. 
And uh, it comes to a point where one day Norman sits me down in the office and says, hey, I want to talk to you. And uh, he tells me he's thinking about getting married. And mm. I'm completely like. What year is this? What year is this? Late 80s. I don't remember. I can't place the year. Okay. Um, but sort of around the time the synagogue is going on, it sounds like. Yeah, around that time. Anyway, I'm floored. I'm absolutely stunned that this would happen because they, Norman had actually had some really, really nice women in his life. And for one reason or another, they never worked out. And he had this woman he was with, and he was thinking of getting married. I just like he said, and I was like, I was so floored. I said, well, duh, do you love her? You know, right. my youthful idiocy and ignorance. And he's like, oh, yeah. And I said, oh, okay. And um, at the wedding ceremony, I find out that she's five months pregnant. And she was much younger, right? Yeah, she, well, she was younger. And uh, that changed our relationship a lot. We weren't close in a traditional family way before that. We were more like comrades because it seems we kind of like, we almost grew up like brothers in a way because of our situation. Yeah. You know? Living in the office and, together. Yeah. Yeah. And the whole thing. So it was a very, it was a, it was a unique relationship. I don't think it was anything like a, any kind of typical family relationship, but but this woman being involved really sort of changed our dynamic. And it was, it was harder, I think, to be close to him in that situation when he was with that family. Around the office, it was fine because that was just our scene. Um, the bottom fell out here in 91. Black Monday was what, 88, 87, 88? 87. It took a few years. The Hamptons is a bubble. And there's so much money here that it's almost immune to what happens economically in the rest of the, of the country or the world, just because there's so much money here. But three or four years after Black Monday, the effect was felt here and the bubble was, was, was popped to some extent. And, you know, I've been working independently for a while. And I didn't have any work. And Norma didn't have much work going on and, and things were tight. So my wife and I decided that, that we were going to move to Delaware where I was going to do graduate studies in computer science. And we're in Delaware, not even for a month or two, two months maybe. I get a call from my father and very cryptic. He says, I have this debilitating illness. And he said, I can't sleep at night. And I'm, I'm like, wait a minute, well, what's going on? What, what can I do? And he's like, I don't know. And he pretty much hangs up on me. So I'm surprised, obviously. And I, I write him a letter. And I said, hey, look, you know, if something's wrong, I need to know. You need to tell me what's going on so I can do what I need to do to help you out. And a week later, he calls and he says, oh, there's nothing. It was just insomnia. So everything's fine. And he's like, oh, why, why don't you come up and stay with me for a couple of days? Uh, it'll be just like old times. I couldn't because I was doing this graduate student student studies and I was enrolled in school and I had all this stuff going on. And there was a property deal we were trying to close and I, I just couldn't do it at the time. And I said, hey, I'd love to, but I can't. And he's like, oh, oh that's okay. It's okay. It's fine. A week later, I get a call from Keith Boyce who was my father's right-hand man for 15 years. And he said, your father's missing in the ocean. They think he drowned. And I knew right away that Norman had taken his own life. Yeah. I just knew it. I just knew in my heart that he was gone. And the more details I found out about everything, the more it confirmed to me that, yeah, that's what had happened. And I guess Corbusier did the same thing. And I don't know if that was Norman's role model or what, but he, he checked out. And later I found out that he had some health issues and that his marriage was in pretty bad shape. And carrying the guilt that he carried from my mother's death, which obviously never would have happened if they hadn't split up, right, right in his mind. Right. And having young children and the reflection of the relation to, you know, with my experience, he just couldn't deal with it emotionally. And you take that and you add the guilt from his mother and then the health effects. So here's a guy who's got health problems. And he's in a really emotionally bad place. There's no options for him. So he checks out. It was presented at the time and, and even a decade or two later as this, you know, great mystery. But it doesn't sound like a mystery at all. It's not a mystery at all. And, you know, I mean, part of that, I think, was the widow trying to secure life insurance payment, which is not going to apply if somebody's committed suicide. Uh, and part of it was to sort of, I think, shield her complicity in and I really do hold her complicit in my father's death because uh, she was part of that and she was part of the the emotional situation that put him where he was so 
it's a terrible thing. And that's how I see it. After your father died, like a number of architects, his cachet really went up a lot. People started noticing the houses and he was associated with the resales now. All the advertisements were saying Norman Jaffe House and, you know, the ones that weren't getting destroyed. Oh, it's absurd. There was one article recently that popped up where it was claimed that I verified it was a Norman Jaffe original. Yeah. <laughs> and they never even talked to me. And if that was really true, then they'd be preserving these houses instead of tearing them down. Yeah. And the bottom line is that it's great art is is investment. It's not something people like. It's something they think they can make money off of. As an artist now, this is I'm learning about the art world and how that works. And at the lower level, people are buying art because they like it. At a higher level, they're buying art because they don't know anything, but they think it's going to make them money. Yeah. It's, it's a very interesting industry. To a great extent, I think the same thing is true about architecture. And it's, it's too bad. It's really too bad. So like any great artist, yeah. Norman was never satisfied with his work. He could always do better. And he always wanted to do better. And I sometimes think of that Picasso painting on glass. Have you seen that? No. So there's a short film of Picasso painting on a piece of glass. So you're looking through the glass of Picasso and he starts painting. And you put some paint on there and you're watching and watching. And all of a sudden you're like, oh my God, that's amazing. Because he's got this amazing thing on the glass. And then he keeps going and it turns into something else. And you're like, oh no, what did he do? Why did he do that? And he would cycle through these various things, some of which were magnificent, some of which were awful. And it was almost like he didn't know when to stop, but he just kept trying this stuff. And I think my father was like that to a great extent. I mean, one of the great examples was the Reese house, where they were building the garage next to the Reese house. And it was a sort of a miniature version of the house. And Norman shows up one day and he's like, tear it down, take it down. And what? So they tear it down. And then they start, he gives them a plan. They start reframing. They're building up another thing. And then he changes that one. And he changes that one. So he would repeatedly change these things sometimes as works in progress, like he was modeling clay or something. And it used to be a joke. The framing carpenters would say, yeah, we're going to we're going to put this together with finished nails so it's easier to take apart. <laughs> <laughs> so he, he had this reputation of being a difficult artist, which I really don't think was true. I think the clients were trying often to sort of palm off responsibility for blowing up their budgets on Norman, which he was complicit in, no doubt. Sure. But I mean, he really wanted to do good work. And and that was more than probably one of the most important lessons from my father was that, you know, the project always comes first. You, your, your responsibility is to the project. It's not to the builder. It's not to the client. It's to the project. And your job is to get it done to the best of your ability, which is what I've always taken to heart in my work. After all this experience in architecture, I'm now an artist. And uh, like most things in my life, it sort of happened by accident. I had an architectural client who basically gave me a commission. And people saw the work and there was a great response. And I think, well, I should probably do some more of this. And here I am now, six or seven years later, and I'm actually, believe it or not, making a living as an artist. But when I think about this, I'm just so happy not to be doing architecture and not to be trying to satisfy the neurotic fantasies of, you know, the insatiable neurotic fantasies of the rich. Yeah. And the difference really now is, I mean, I'm working for the same people. The same people are buying my work for the most part. But the difference is instead of being married to them for two years, they can come and look at my work. And if they like it, they can buy it. And if not, well, hey, thanks for stopping by. Right. It's a much <laughs> shorter relationship and easier. It's a much nicer relationship. Yes, much cleaner. Miles, it's been such a pleasure learning about you and your father. Thank you so much for talking with me. No trouble. It's my pleasure, George. Thank you. You can see all of Norman Jaffe's houses and hear Miles reading from his memoir at usmodernist.org slash Jaffe. That's J-A-F-F-E. Thanks for listening. U.S. Modernist Radio is underwritten by Diane Bald and the Budman family restoring significant architecture in Toronto, Los Angeles, Malibu, and Palm Springs. 
Visit usmodernist.org's massive archives to listen to past shows, discover documentation of 15,000 significant modernist houses, and access 4 million pages of classic 20th century architecture magazines. U.S. Modernist Radio is produced by Soundtracks Recording Studios in Raleigh, North Carolina. Our theme song is performed by George Smart and Robinson Earl. U.S. Modernist Radio is a production of Modernist Archive Incorporated, a nonprofit educational archive for the documentation, preservation, and promotion of modernist residential design. I'm Tom Guile. George and I will be back soon with another Children of Genius edition of U.S. Modernist Radio. Children of Genius.